Well, good afternoon to you, Hillview. It's good to be here. We are wrapping up 2 Thessalonians. So, you know, we want one more message for those of you who are looking for something new, then two weeks from now, you'll be there. But uh, we're going to wrap up with uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse, verses 6 to 15. So you would open your Bibles or your iPads or whatever you use to that passage. Paul's going to have this last hard-hitting message, if you will, before he ends in a prayer and a, and a conclusion. So we want to look at this section of 10 verses this morning. So first, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 15. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the, transition, with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage you in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Let's bow our hearts together one more time before we hear the message. Father, this morning as we listen to your word through your Holy Spirit, might you empower the words that are spoken so that it might be impactful to all of us, Father, as we, re we read and heed and understand and apply the word, the living word of God in our, our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, this is a pretty hard-hitting passage that Paul's going to bring to the Thessalonian church. I don't know if you, uh, as, we, as we talked about this, you know, we've seen some pretty high and lofty heavenly spiritual topics. You know, we've talked about the day of the Lord, talked about um, the man of lawlessness, the day of Christ. We've talked about him coming to earth. I mean, pretty cool, out there kind of topics. And Paul is now transitioning to a very earthly topic, a very practical topic about work. I don't know how many of you, as you think about work, you're like, you know what, it's Sunday, it's my day off, you know, I'd rather not talk about that. Tomorrow is Monday, and so, but Paul is going to talk about it with the Thessalonians, not only, I think, to help us understand what work is about, but they were having a problem. They were having a problem. We've talked about it before that there were a few people that were just not excited about working. And so Paul wanted to discuss that with them. He had talked about it before, and we'll see. We talked about it in 1 Thessalonians, and here we are. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul is going to talk about it again. Uh, you know, work probably has a lot of different feelings, you know, among us. Perhaps there are some of us that are just loving the passionate passionate about the things we do, and we get up on Monday morning, we're like, I cannot wait to show up. Uh, to go to work today. Uh, perhaps most of you are like, get up on Monday and go, here we go again. I've got to go to work because guess what? I've got a bills to pay and mouths to feed, so this is what we do. Perhaps this is, you can relate to some of these, some of these thoughts here. Thank God it's Friday because that means I get to rest. Uh, maybe tomorrow you'll be like this. Uh, some of you may have bumper stickers that look like this. Maybe it doesn't say fishing. Maybe, you know, I'd rather be whatever uh, on my iPad watching Netflix, uh, or something like that, or this one. Maybe some of us are these people here, these, what is it? How do you do this? These idiots here. Hopefully no one's here like that. Hump day, right? I mean, there's been commercials about this, right? It's hump day. Uh, Get, can't wait. I'm halfway to, halfway to Saturday, right? And then there's this one. Mostly humans. Mostly humans. You know, there's a lot of feelings about work, right? Uh, here's some sayings perhaps that you've maybe even seen or heard. I take the risk. 
This could have been me when I was younger. I was kind of lazy, I admit it. <laughs> Work fascinates me. My, my parents could say, don't you see all the leaves in the yard? No, I don't. <laughs> it really, really doesn't bother me. Some of us here in the Bay Area, perhaps, this is kind of key why we go to work. Work is a four-letter word, and it is, right? I mean, it is a four-letter word, but hey, sometimes we have pretty rough thoughts about work, the drudgery, the toil that we have to do. The only reason I go to work is because, well, maybe your spouse likes to shop, we like to eat, all those kind of things. But uh, I really believe that Paul had some different things in mind about work and why he was so concerned about work. Again, this wasn't the first time he had talked about it. Here we have 1 Thessalonians 2. You know, he says, hey, in labor and toil, we work night and day. He worked, right, in 1 Thessalonians 4. He even says very similar things to the passage that we're talking about today. Work with your hands. Okay, and then in 1 Thessalonians 5, respect your leaders who labor and toil among you. I mean, this was an important topic to Paul. Why was this so why was he so concerned about work? Well, number one, if you look at this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we realize that people are watching us. People are watching how we work. Believe it or not, if you say, I'm a Christian and you're at work, people watch you differently. Paul says that we need to walk properly before outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. You know, there's a lot of discussion about why these people, these believers, they're Christians, why they weren't working. Um, I listened to a, a three-part sermon on John, John MacArthur. He, he spent three hours speaking on this topic. I'll try to keep mine under an hour if I can. But, uh, you know, the Jews, they really believed that secular work wasn't as important as sacred work. And so to them, it's like, you know, if I could meditate, read, write, ponder over Scripture, that was more important than working. And so, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing all that manual labor. Uh, maybe I should be like these, these monks and just ponder and think and not have to worry about doing secular work. Uh, then, of course, we know not only were there Jews who were saved, but there were also Greeks who were saved. And in the Greek culture, you know, free men don't work. We have slaves to do that kind of business for us. So why should I be working? You know, we have these great pictures of, of wonderful thinkers who did contemplation and reading and studying and learning, and that was more exalted than manual labor. I mean, we have these great thinkers, of men, so there's no reason for me to be working. Uh, and then, of course, the third reason why perhaps some of these people weren't working is because Paul had given them a message, right? And he had to kind of tell them a little bit more because they had gotten it wrong, but Jesus was going to come back. Jesus was, matter of fact, they thought Jesus had already come back. So, well, you know, things are going to go downhill, so why work? But then Paul says, no, no, he hasn't coming back. He's coming back soon. And what's the point? I mean, how many of you have heard or talked about people that said, hey, you know, I've given you the date. Jesus is coming back this date. So what do people do? Well, you know, sell your possessions. Go up to the mountaintop. Have a party because it's all going to be ending. Uh, well, that didn't work out so well for them either. And it wasn't working out so well for these believers. You know, they were waiting for the paper to roll out that said, hey, it's all over. Uh, but Paul was concerned about work. You know, why is work that important? You know, I'm talking about like what occupation you have, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or a plumber or a teacher. But why is our occupation, our daily work that important? Does God really care about our work? Is he that concerned about it? Could that be a little reason why Paul was talking about this? You know, uh, sometimes we think, I think, as we go to work and we're battling traffic on I-85 and you're like, this is not fun, you know, that maybe work just comes from the curse. You know, I've read about that in the Old Testament. You know, everything was good until Adam and Eve kind of yeah, things didn't go so well after that. And so let's go back and take a look at that. You know, this, this idea of work coming from, from this part. In Genesis chapter 3, I'll even put it up there. Adam, he said, he's, God is talking to Adam after sin. He says, because you obeyed your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, uh, you must not eat from it. He said, cursed is the ground thanks to you. In painful toil, you will eat all the days of your life. It will produce thorns 
and thistles for you. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat food until you return to the ground. It doesn't seem like that's all that inviting, does it, really? Painful toil, thorns and thistles, sweat of your brow. I mean, it kind of makes sense. Like, why should I be doing this day to day when basically, because someone messed up, we have a hard time? I mean, I don't think many of us are actually going out uh, to farm to make sure we can eat for the day. We usually probably work in air conditioning buildings, but you get the idea that from the curse, maybe people think that work is just something I got to do, but it wasn't what God had intended from the beginning. And you, so sometimes I think when we are unsure about, you know, what's the right answer between the, the wrestle that we might have, if we turn and really gaze upon the face of God, really think about the character and nature of God, then we can get a better understanding of what Paul and why Paul is so interested in work. And so as we look upon the nature and character of God, we realize that God was a pretty phenomenal worker. Um, God made a pretty spectacular place for us to, to be a part of, a perfect place of splendor, of provision, forethought, and he sustains it all. When we look in just a little bit earlier in Genesis chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3, you know, we see this where the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day to make it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. You know, a lot of times we focus on that resting part, like, yeah, God rested, God rested. But in reality, God did a lot of work. God made a lot of things happen. It's kind of interesting, like, why, why is it that God took six days to make this place? You know, I mean, God's all-powerful, right? Seems like he could have just gone, it would all be in place. It would all be set. Why take six days to create the world? And the reason was, not only is God a worker, not only was he the first worker, the original of, originator of work, but he wanted to set an example for us that we would work, to realize that work is good. It's not something that's cursed, and we should not think of it as cursed, but God, as the originator of work, said, this is good. He set an example. That was his intention for you and me when it comes to work. And then, when God created man before the fall, we see very much a similar thing, that God had created man to work. When we look a little further in Genesis chapter 2, he said, The Lord God took man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the man gave names. Perhaps that was the first job that God gave us, made names for all the livestock, all the birds of the heaven and the beasts of the field. So here we see God's intention from the beginning that man was to work. Man was to work. You know, Solomon, who was a pretty wise person in his own right, uh, had some ideas about this in Ecclesiastes, and I won't read the whole passage, but twice in Ecclesiastes, he indicated that work was a gift of God. This is a gift of God, he says, the toil and labor that you do. If you look at the last part of that, for he will not remember, speaking of man, much of the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the joy of his heart. Is that interesting? Is that interesting that as you're, I don't know how many of you are on your way to battle the traffic in 85 and go, wow, this is a gift of God. <laughs> you know, I think about when I'm, uh, <laughs> you know, when I'm sitting there at the front counter at Chick-fil-A and someone walks up and says, you know, my sandwich was supposed to have no pickles, and you gave it to me with pickles. And I say, this is a gift of God. <laughs> it's a joy in our hearts. It can be hard, right? But that's the intention that God had for us. Um, all right, I'm not sure. Is that me? <laughs> Somebody's got something going. Well, I think, uh, you know, and God not only did this for man, but, you know, he outlined it in the Ten Commandments. So most of us can probably, that's not the seventh commandment, but actually it's the seventh day, right? We think about the fourth commandment that God gave in Exodus. We look, turn the, and it says, 
what? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And that's it, right? That's, that's the fourth commandment. And so it's all about rest. It's all about relaxation. But when you actually go back and read the whole thing, it gets a little more interesting. The commandment says, Six days you will, shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord our, your God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So you think about that. No one, no one really thinks of the fourth commandment as six days you shall work. Does anybody use that as the fourth commandment? Not really. Damn, it's all about rest. And I, and I honestly think that's true. God wanted his people to rest. Remember, he said that the Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the, the commandment is about resting. But it's also indicative of God's originality in work. His character is in nature. And that is, he worked. And so God says, six days you shall work and do all your labor. Well, I think it's important for us to take this little detour to understand work because Paul, in his epistle to both 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, mentioned work so many times. So there must be a reason, I think, as we understand the character and nature of God when it comes to work, we can better understand why Paul was so adamant about these believers that really weren't perking, pulling their work, if you will, pulling uh, their, their, uh, their weight here in Thessalonians. So Paul, as we get into the passage, is gonna kinda, I'm going to walk through four different areas that I think are important as we think about this. And both they're addressed to the church, the church at Thessalonians. They're addressed to those lazy believers that were there. They were believers. And also addressed to us, I think, today, and uh, to understand. So we're going to look at these four points. So first of all, Paul says, avoiding the undisciplined, avoiding the undisciplined. Now we command you, brothers, it says in verse 5, excuse me, verse 6, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. It's pretty strong language that Paul uses. We command you. If you look at even this passage, he uses the word command three different times. Earlier in 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul was a little more touchy-feely. Uh, he said, we urge you, we urge you, we urge you three times. A little more personal, if you will. Uh, so while he was there, Paul said, hey, everybody needs to get to work. He mentions, we, we urge you in 1 Thessalonians. Hey, we really kind of urge you to work. And now Timothy came back and said, it looks like they're still not working. So we command you, we command you. The strongest language, the strongest name. You know, a lot of times you might say, hey, the Lord says this, or the Lord Jesus said this, but uh, Paul goes even further. The Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> we command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you avoid and keep away from them. It's pretty strong language. It's interesting that there's really nothing new here. I don't know, I don't know if any of you have kids like mine. Probably don't, but... Uh, I mean, go clean your room. Go, uh, don't be nice to your, be nice to your sister. Put away your toys. And unfortunately, if I say it once, it oftentimes did not happen. I had to say it twice, three times, four times. Again, you probably didn't have that problem in your own family. But uh, <laughs> Paul, Paul has the same problem. He's told them while he was there. He tells them in 1 Thessalonians, he's got to tell them again. It's sad. These are Christians who are just not following through on what God has for them in their work, in their labor. So through that, Paul is saying, like, I've done this before. You received this from us before. Uh, for even when we were with you, we gave you this command. And then, of course, as I mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the similar thing, just as we instructed you, you know, when I, was, when I was doing that little uh, talk with the elders and talking to them about, hey, what, what would you encourage the church? And, you know, how would you, how would you have them help you? A lot of them is like, you know, just do what God asks, you know, the first time. <laughs> and that would really encourage us. And so Paul is like, will you please just do what I ask and do the right thing? Uh, so for even when we were with you, not only, so who are these undisciplined people? Um, your Bible probably has a number of different names for them undisciplined, idle, unruly, disruptive, 
disorderly. And really, it comes from a, a kind of a military term. So I was kind of embracing that as I was, as I was doing that. When I was at the Air Force Academy, uh, we would take, you know, these brand new guys. And, of course, back then, most of them had long hair. So, you know, off with your hair. And then I had uh, the audacious uh, opportunity to teach them all how to march. Uh, so you can imagine uh, that times that didn't go so well. Uh, it looks a lot like this picture. You know, here you got some with their arms back, some forward. I mean, we want all their feet to be all lined up, but it, it's not the case. So the idea of this word is that, that people were out of step. They were not in step, and it's easy to see in a group of people when someone was out of step. And Paul is saying that these idle people that aren't working, they're out of step. You remember I talked about your testimony, and so the people were seeing that there are people who aren't working. And Paul says, you need to get in step. You need to be um, kind of following what God has. So not only who were these people, they were out of step, they were idle, and Paul says, keep away. You know, it's a pretty hard thing, right? I mean, here we are, three steps into this. I've told you, I've written once, I've written twice, it's time to keep away. Uh, that's a pretty strong thing. Why would we have to keep away? Again, that tarnished testimony. You know, people are watching you. I hope, I hope the people in your workplace and your, where do you go to school, you know, know that you're a believer. But with that comes a sense of responsibility, right? I don't know how many of you have the little igthus, the little fish on the back of your car, and then you speed on 85. Hmm, hey, that's a Christian. He's speeding. She's speeding. Hmm, tarnished testimony, huh? <laughs> that's why I just keep that off. No, so <laughs> not good, I know. You know, but Paul is also going to talk about it in, Thess in, in Corinth. He's going to talk about bad company corrupting or ruining good morals. So, you know, bad behavior, when you associate with bad behavior, it can rub off of you. I mean, how many of us like to work hard and we're next to a coworker who's lazy or not doing any work? Uh, kind of drags you down, does it not? Why should I work so hard when this person is getting the same pay and working at, at a much slower pace? So not only does it tarnish your testimony, but it also can be contagious. But the goal, I mean, the goal really was to embarrass them into getting back to work. Let's get back to work. Change your behavior. No more mooching off friends and family and no more mooching off Christians. Um, you've probably, probably heard the saying, it's hard to soar like an eagle when you're surrounded by turkeys, right? <laughs> uh, it's hard to soar like eagles when you're surrounded by turkeys, Sometimes we get drugged down by people who aren't responding in the right way, and I think that was the case here in Thessalonica. We had believers who really weren't working the way they should, weren't having the testimony that Paul and the Lord wanted to display, and so it was dragging them down. So not only are we to avoid the undisciplined, but Paul says we want you to accept hard work. And the reason why is because, number one, we had the example before you. We did the right thing. In verse 7, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you. Uh, you know, Paul says we were not idle. Basically, completely the opposite of what these people, these Thessalonian Christians who are not working are doing. He's like, we're not undisciplined. Uh, the opposite of idle. Not unruly. Not busybodies. You know, Paul, he says, hey, we didn't accept free food. You know, we worked hard. We didn't accept free bread. We worked night and day, and we weren't a burden to you. Um, that's something that, you know, Paul wanted to have. Maybe he got there when he first got to Thessalonians, and, boy, he preached the gospel. People were saved, and all of a sudden they decided, whoo, you know, he's, I'm saved. Christ is coming back. Let's stop this working bit. You know, this is for the birds. And Paul says, no, let me show you exactly how I want you to act. And so he worked, worked with his hands night and day so that he wouldn't be a burden. You know, Paul later says, hey, I had the right. I'm an apostle sent by Jesus Christ. I, if anybody has a right not to work and for you to give us food, that would be me. I have a right to do it. But Paul says, I didn't want to do that. He says, when we were with you, we wanted to give you an example that you would follow. So you know, we think about that in our workplace, right? The example that we set for the people around us. As we go, we work hard. Um, 
You know, it's about being a good leader. I, sometimes I'll come into Chick-fil-A, and you'll see me. I'm on the front counter, like with a register, taking orders. And, and I don't need to do that. I have people to do that. But sometimes I do that because I want to set the example for them so that they understand exactly how I want to, to be with every guest that comes through there. So Paul wanted to set the example so that they understood the importance of hard work. And for what purpose? For what purpose? You know, really, you know, Paul was... Um, was really wanted to make sure that they understood that work was from God. Now, he didn't really lay it out here, that, that the, what we talked about earlier, but Paul, I believe, understood that work was a good thing from God, and we needed to do that. So Paul then, as he thinks about accepting hard work, gets into a, even a more difficult passage. For In verse 10, he says, For even when we're with you, we would give you this command, this command again, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. That's pretty harsh, right? <laughs> I mean, people quote that. If you don't work, you don't eat. That's good, that's good uh, uh, impetus, right, to work when you get hungry. <laughs> Imagine how things happen, right? I mean, Genesis 3, it comes right out of that. In pain you shall eat of the ground the, des- the rest of your life. By the sweat of your brow you will eat food. You've probably seen some of this, these signs will work for food. Uh, when we see that a lot. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't use the sign for the real purpose that it was created. If you offer them a job, they're like, well, you know, maybe you could just give me some money. I was, uh, I, we were traveling one time, and I, I remember this vividly. We stopped at a gas station, and a gentleman comes by, and he was asking. I was in a different area of the, the getting gas, and there was a different pump set. And so he was asking this gentleman over there if he could have some money to get some food. So I don't know what, I couldn't understand what the guy was actually saying, but he went in to pay, came out, and he gave him a sandwich. And, you know, the guy said, thank you. And then the gentleman who was getting the gas, you know, walked, uh, drove off and left. And I watched the, the, the homeless gentleman or whatever who got the sandwich walk over and toss it in the garbage can. And away he went. And I was like, wow, that, that's brutal. Um, that's tough. It's kind of easy to get jaded, right? You kind of wonder makes it hard to understand, you know. Unfortunately, perhaps the willingness to work hard is, has really not been cured in the 2,000 years since, since Paul, through the Holy Spirit, wrote this, right? You know, our occupation is really not that important. We're not in a materialistic society as believers, so where we work to get our money, but we should be different, Right? We should be different, our responsibility. We should have a deep sense of responsibility above those without Christ because we serve the Lord Christ. Uh, so when we think about that and we think, you know, like, like that gentleman with the sandwich, like how do I know why I should limit charity? I mean, charity is good, right? And I can think of three reasons that I, I kind of did. We, when we were, I was at a church previously and we had a gentleman who was, very into the homeless, and it was, it was, he had a great ministry, but a lot of times he wanted to just give money and food away to everybody, regardless of who they were or what they wanted. And so we entered into a deep study of, you know, who are the poor? Who are those in need? And how do we discern, you know, what to give and who to give for? And as we, you know, some of these, some of our thoughts came from some of these things. You know, it, some, it harms the recipients and limits their, their, the sin of idleness is encouraged, temptation towards sin limits their independence. Um, certainly it can harm the giver because misappropriated, you know, charity and benevolence coming from you and I and going to the wrong place. Uh, we might also harm the needy, those who are quiet and, and don't speak up and don't receive uh, uh, charity because they need it. And lastly, it could harm the community. You know, perhaps it discourages you and I from giving when when we see the kind of misappropriations where the gentleman tosses the sandwich, and you're like, well, I'm not going to give to anybody anymore. Um, I mean, that's not the right attitude, but it can kind of creep into us as we, as we do. So there are some times when we may need to limit our charity and understand, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So not only was Paul to, uh, to uh, wanted to give them the example, but he also says in verse uh, 11, excuse me, that we should adhere to our own business. For we hear among you that they walk in idleness. We hear. Interesting is Paul turns his attention back to the Christians 
And he says, we hear, you know, this, this wasn't something that people didn't un- know and understand. You know, uh, Paul was, uh, if you remember back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 27, at the end of, cha- of the 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes, he says, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. So you can imagine uh, they probably ended up reading 2 Thessalonians as well. Uh, so the church is filled. Uh, someone gets up and he says, For I hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Job? I think Paul knew who these people were. <laughs> and so they're reading it out in front. We hear, we hear, Paul knew these people. And so he was, you know, calling them out, if you will. Calling them out. That we hear that there are those among you walking in idleness. This interesting work, not, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Sometimes, you know, uh, language doesn't actually translate very well. My, my in-laws sometimes tell a joke in Spanish, and then they try to translate it in English, and eh, it, it really doesn't work. It's, you just don't understand. And in Greek, is the same way. It's kind of interesting. Uh, busy at work and busy bodies has a very similar Greek word. In other words, you're you should be busy at work, but instead you're busy in other people's business. But the Greek word is very similar. Uh, I, I love this definition, so I had to put it up. If you look at 1A there, used apparently of a person officiously inquisitive about others' affairs. Uh, I had to look up officiously. I'm not that smart. Uh, and so someone wrote this definition of officiously. Uh, uh, let's see objectionably aggressive in offering one's unrequested and unwanted services, help, or advice. That didn't really help me too much. I was like, that doesn't help me. Then they said meddlesome. Okay, meddlesome. Yeah, I get that. So basically, these people weren't busy at work like they should have been. They were meddling in other people's affairs. They were kind of going around. Maybe it was asking for money or time or food or something. But they were busy in other people's affairs, but not busy in working like they should have been. Um, And Paul says, no, we need to adhere to our own business. Such persons, he says, strong words, again, strong name. Paul says, I command you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Yeah, I command you and encourage you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do their work quietly and earn their own living. It's interesting he uses the word in the Lord Jesus Christ and not by the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes it personal. These are believers, remember? These are, these are fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in this together. We're all in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what you do affects us. What you do affects our testimony. We're in the Lord Jesus Christ, intimate, personal. We're in this together. Work quietly. Earn your own living. Paul reminds us, live quietly and mind your own affairs. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, remember he had said this before. Paul's like, this is not new. We need to get this right. Um, Adhere to your own business. Paul then kind of turns his heart toward the believers that are actually being the ones who are generous, the generous Thessalonians. He says, as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. You know, when you're taken advantage of, I, that gentleman did not see the, uh, the homeless person toss the sandwich in the garbage, but I did. Boy, all of a sudden, judgmental, right? Why would I want to give that person a sandwich? Condemnation, disgust. It's easy to grow weary sometimes when we give food. I mean, I know in Chick-fil-A, you know, it's easy to get taken advantage of. People just take advantage of you. And I tell my team, just be generous. It's coming from me, and I do it for the Lord. So just be generous and do it for the Lord. Uh, Paul really, not only here in Thessalonians, talks about doing good and not growing weary. He said in Galatians chapter 6, which probably was written really close to around this time, maybe even before, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. A couple other verses, Peter actually writes a couple of times about it in the same way. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Hmm. Amazing what doing good will will do. 
to silence those around us, right? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Paul says, don't grow weary. Sometimes it's easy in our flesh to grow weary, but we have an amazing example, not only Paul, but also the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in Acts chapter 10, Luke writes, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. What an amazing example we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, who, I mean, think about it. He healed someone's hand, and what did they say? Why are you doing this on the Sabbath? Just knock that off. He, uh, you know, I mean, he tried to heal people, and, and they berated him. You know, he said, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, what? Who are you to forgive sins? Jesus was busy doing good for three years and really received nothing in return. And yet, he didn't grow weary, thankfully. He didn't grow weary in doing good. He went to the cross and died for you and for me so that we might have eternal life. He never grew weary in doing good. I know it's easy for me to grow weary <laughs> sometimes when I see the people around me that don't seem to appreciate it. So the question might come up, when do we avoid, because in, in the first Part of it says, hey, avoid those that are not working. And when do we give? It's really not an, I'll tell you right now, I don't have all the answers to that, that I've failed uh, both in both ways. I've failed to be generous, and I've failed uh, in other ways as well. But I think prayer is probably the most important thing. Pray that you would have a heart of compassion, the heart of compassion like the Lord Jesus Christ. And then pray for discerning spirit. You know, my dad, I'm sure the elders here can attest to it, but my dad, uh, you know, we didn't have a church phone, so, you know, in the directory it said Community Bible Fellowship, and it had our telephone number. <laughs> so people would call and say, hey, I'm stuck in the highway, I need gas money to get home, my wife's pregnant, my kids are sick, my, you know, and the story goes on and on. And so how do you know? How do you know what, when to give and when to avoid? It's not easy. Pray for a discerning spirit. Pray for a heart of compassion. I told my team in Chick-fil-A, you know, if you don't know what to do, then just default to generosity. I won't ever, I won't ever beat you. If you give 10 sauces away for your Chick-fil-A sandwich, uh, and, you know, I won't ever fault you for being generous. So default to generosity. And lastly, as we think about who should be generous to, uh, Proverbs has so many verses that teach us about generosity and the oppressed and the poor. I encourage you to read it, but here's a few. Proverbs 14, he who despises his neighbor's sins, but happy is he who is gracious to the poor. Again, later in chapter 14, he who oppresses the poor taunts his maker. That's a pretty strong condemnation to anyone who taunts the poor. In, in Proverbs 22, he who is generous will be blessed for he gives some of his food to the poor. And then Proverbs 28, he who gives to the poor will never want, but he who shuts his eyes will have many curses. So I think defaulting to God, to generosity is something good. I think also if we think that we're doing it for God and not the individual, that can make all the difference in the world. You know, if you give the sandwich to the gentleman and you watch him toss it into the garbage can, you just say, you know, that was for God. That wasn't for this person. That was for God. And if we have that attitude, regardless of whether he tosses it in the trash can or whether he eats it, we do it unto God. And then we know it's between him and the Lord, whatever happens. So the last part of this is that Paul is going back to talk to the church and said, we're going to admonish the disobedient. If anyone does not obey, what is written in this letter, he says in verse 14, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Again, that's pretty harsh, right? <laughs> kind of beckons, harkens back to Matthew, if you will, chapter 18, church discipline, right? If you've taken peacemakers, you've probably seen this. But here we are, the four-step process of, uh, of church discipline. Paul likely had already talked to these individuals. Maybe Timothy did. Maybe Someone probably had. They've got to step one and said, hey, you people need to get to work. 
Uh, probably maybe when Timothy went back, he grabbed some of the leaders, take one or two, got on to step two and said, hey, there's, there's two of us now. Let's, let's figure this out. Let's get back to work. So basically, Paul is moving on to step three in this letter. He says, the undisciplined busybodies, let's step it up to level three. You know, I can see him They're reading this, reading this passage of 1 Thessalonians to the whole church. And they're probably seated right there. <laughs> And they're getting the message. Uh, church discipline. So, but it's interesting that Paul recognizes that these are believers. We're not to step four yet. Uh, we want to get them back. We want to get them back doing what's right. We want them to get back their testimony for God. So we want them to treat them as a brother and not an enemy, he says. And the goal is really to shame them into obedience. Sometimes it takes that. Those are the steps in church discipline, so that we might do that. Well, there's a lot of things as we think about Paul's exhortation to hard work. You know, we've seen the message to the church to avoid those who are working, you know, to who those are not working, to accept hard work for those who aren't working, that they should get to work, adhere to their own business, and admonish the disobedient. I was reminded of a uh, the email that comes out every day to pray for leaders. And this was, I'm not sure if this was elders or deacons, but it was day 20. I know that. Colossians 3, 23, 24, I think is a great takeaway for this passage. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward, receive the inheritance as your reward. You know, if we do our work, if we give our charity as unto the Lord, it can make all the difference in who we are before men. And certainly before God. Uh, And so work is good. God made it so. So I would challenge you as I challenge myself, you know, not to celebrate hump day because, you know, work is good. God's destined me to be here. Not to celebrate TGIF because work is good. It's okay. Uh, For us believers, don't tire of doing good. Don't tire of doing good. And give generously, generously with care, generosity to follow God's example. May the Lord work in our own lives as we contemplate these thoughts. Let's pray together. Father, just thank you for your word as it speaks to us. Thank you for the example of Paul, that he could say, follow my example of hard work, of diligence, working night and day and not being a burden. Thank you for the example of of you, Father, and your creation, that you created us for work. May we following your footsteps to do our work is unto you, uh, to be a blessing to those around us and not a burden. In your son's precious name we pray.